that none of you who I think presented your cases so, so, so admirably and insightfully uh, didn't touch upon an important component which I think is also a product of the Western Enlightenment, that is the idea of nationalism uh, and the idea of uh, we and you. That also is another, and, uh, you know, antidote of what I can call it an antidote of nationalism. Uh, what was good certainly was the liberal values, but restricted largely to the Western world in its application. So that foreign policy and international relations, when it had to grapple with the complexities of a global order, it has still now somehow or other not been able to encompass the realities of a world which is so different from the West. So its roots still is historically the roots of nationalism, roots of you know, West, what James talked of West, Westphalian international order, which is its origin, uh, it begins with largely European history. The whole world's history, including our part of the world, remains somewhat outside the theoretical construct of the empirical base of international relations or foreign policy. One, to conclude, its roots in nationalism and the concept of we and you, what is good for us is not, is less good for you and still less for another part of the world. It's somehow ingrained in most of the theoretical construct and application of the world order. Uh, isn't it one of the inadequacies of international relations why it is today in a, in a, unable to either predict the world or create a world order which is based on the philosophical foundations of the best of liberalism in Western philosophy. Thank you. Western Enlightenment. Thank you. Uh, I think since you mentioned James Mail, I'll ask uh, Salman, would you care to, to, <laughs> to make a comment on this? I think the first part of your statement uh, no one could possibly argue with. It's uh, on nationalism. No? Uh, Veronica? It's all right. I have to confess, I'm no expert on the Enlightenment at all, and I was actually rather alarmed when Chris asked me to speak to this topic, and I had to do a great deal of background reading. So I don't know that I'm really very qualified to comment, but from what I'm, I have read, I'm not sure that the kind of narrow nationalism that seems to be developing in certain countries today was something which fits easily with the main values and principles of the Enlightenment, as I understand it. Sorry, could you hear that? Um, it, it seems to me more in, in the line of what James Mell was talking about, that there is a tension, and an inevitable, and indeed I touched on it too, an inevitable tension between attachment to international principles and the demands of domestic foreign policy. And it's somewhere in that tension that issues of nationalism arise. And I, I forgive me if I'm simply uh, not well enough read to answer to your question fully, but I, I'm a little surprised by the idea that the Enlightenment en enabled nationalism, if, if that was your, your point. I, I think since um, uh, you mentioned James May, like I, can't forbear but to ask him to respond. Um, thank you, Krishna. Uh, I think that um, you're right that nationalism had its origins in the West. I also think that uh, those who study nationalism um, tend these days to think that nationalism is only uh, exclusive, ethnic, and so forth. And therefore, it seems uh, completely opposed uh, to the tradition of the Enlightenment. 
But the First Nations were Enlightenment projects. Uh, La Grande Nation was French Revolution. The idea that the, that the people may, constituted the nation starts in France. Uh, well, it starts in the United States, of course, but that's a slightly different story. It then picks up in France. The countries of the Atlantic, North Atlantic seaboard, which happened to have been uh, centralized before the era of nationalism, uh, are, be, tend to become civic nations in which there is no uh, necessary tension between liberal values and nationalism. And indeed, they would always have argued and did argue, of course, in the era, that, uh, that you couldn't be a nationalist in a world of diverse and separate polities without being an internationalist. That was all of the argument. Now, historically, as the movement went east, uh, and you know the story, I mean, as the movement goes east, you, you, you find that the, in the middle of the 19th century, the mood to create both dem democratic systems, liberal systems, and national systems, that sort of by demonstration effect, that, that builds up but there isn't a constituency for the politicians because they're talking within deeply agricultural, deeply peasant societies, just as in... So, so in fact, you then begin to find nationalism becoming more and more ethnic, more and more defined in terms other than liberal values. The classic sort of case of the tension that Veronica talks about and how we can all manage to believe two contradictory things was, of course, Mazzini. I mean, Mazzini, the great liberal internationalist, Italian nationalist, who believed perfectly that if all Italians ruled themselves, then they would be the greatest internationalists, the greatest liberals that you could have. So you know, you're stuck with this tension, I think. No. If uh, Tikhar Chaudhry. I didn't quite want to, but I might follow up. Uh, might I follow up on something that you said very you, you must have been wiping your brow. Okay. That's all right. Uh, is it Rouse? Mm -hmm. Thank you for that interesting discussion. And uh, listening to you, I, just to conclude on this, uh, this, this discussion, I'd like to just ask you, what is, in modern times, what is the most... Uh, important uh, change that you think, the panel thinks, has come about from enlightenment? Is it in government? Is it in science? Uh, is it in uh, politics? Where do you see the change most notably? Of course, barring nationalism, which we've talked about already. And so I'd, I'd like to comment on that, please. Well, that, that's um, a very broad question, isn't it? Um, I, I think, as I said, uh, in terms of politics, the changes didn't come for a very long time after what is generally considered the main Enlightenment period. And then the main change, I think, was the setting up of the United Nations as an international organization. And I think I did demonstrate there that that, um, that it was the United Nations is actually clearly based on, on Enlightenment values. But whether that was the biggest change, I don't know. I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a scientist, but clearly the whole scientific scene was, was um, something which developed, to the extent to which it developed on the basis of Enlightenment values and would have scientific uh, exploration would have developed in any case with or without enlightenment values, I don't know, but there were, there were huge changes certainly in that period and beyond well into the, well they're still going on aren't they, in terms of um, 
dare to understand, dare to reason. That's what scientists do. Um, I would like to think, but this is really um, an idealistic thought, that the biggest change would be eventually a system which resulted in world peace, which is what uh, Kant was arguing for in his On Peace. But that seems, as we've heard, that seems to be a very long way off. Um, perhaps, I'd, I'd, I can't give you a direct answer as to which was the most important. They were all in their different ways the most Im very important. I mean, tolerance uh, was also um, something which developed more or considerably um, over the years. But which, which was the first and most important? I don't know. I'm sorry. follow up on that, do you think it might have been science? Because, what? because of the reason being given so much importance in enlightenment, do you think it could have been science that benefited most from enlightenment? Yes, I do, actually. I think I, I was more or less I was thinking through the various main tenets of the enlightenment. And I think you may well be right that it is scientific discovery, which, um, which is the, one of the key factors. Can I just add a, a quick footnote? I agree very much. I agree. Uh, my, if you want to, if you want to, sort of get a, a hard image of the Enlightenment, go to the what used to be the entrance to the reading room in the British Museum, which now contains Sir John Soane's uh, uh, collections uh, of, and they illustrate curiosity and skepticism. But I think in the realm of uh, international relations, the uh, carriers of that tradition are perhaps the diplomatic profession. And I don't want to just uh, give praise to all my friends around here, but I, I do believe that because, um, and I've, Krishna will have to forgive me, he knows this, I've compared diplomats before with dog owners. You know the story that dog owners uh, tend to be regarded after a bit as looking more and more like their dogs. And I think that um, uh, diplomats, rather similarly, they sometimes get a bad press because they look more and more like each other and less like the people that allegedly they're representing. And that's normally held up um, to be uh, a, a negative point. I think it's an enormously positive point. The more diverse the world is, the more uh, we're locked together in all sorts of economic and, uh, uh, and strategic and other ways, uh, as this point has been made before, the more important it is to keep talking. So you need a, a group of people who are sensitive to diversity who can talk to one another because they can translate uh, the dilemmas and issues that they face into their own idiom, but also they can talk in an international language. And that seems to me to be why dog owners are an extremely important legacy of the Enlightenment. Thank you. Um, uh, James, you're a dog owner yourself. Uh, would you? Uh, oh, you too. Well, um, would you say that the same formula applies to professors? But anyway, I leave that. Uh, I, um, I, Raji, if you don't mind, I'll group uh, three uh, questions together. We're, we're really out of time. I'm very keen on keeping the schedule. Uh, Rajiv Bhatia, Devi Fortuna, and uh, Wang Yiwai. Thank you, Chair. Very briefly, uh, uh, enlightenment, uh, a very lucid explanation today, uh, impacted or imprinted not just the Western foreign policy, but I think all of us uh, living in various parts of the world who benefited from the Western education system. But the way it was defined today with those four key characteristics, I think focusing on tolerance. Uh, this is the Achilles heel of enlightenment as we see it, uh, namely did not show ample tolerance of diversity in the world. Enlightenment uh, happened, as we knew now today, from 17th century, but the world existed before that. Uh, so my question is, 
do you feel enlightenment either then or later took into account the values of uh, Chinese, Indian, Egyptian and African civilizations as well? Or was it fundamentally uh, a European concept? Thank you. Uh, by the way, diplomacy also existed before the, uh, before the uh, Enlightenment, long before. But that's neither here nor there. Uh, Devi. Yeah, uh, I think it follows nicely uh, uh, from that question. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, very interested in all your presentations, but uh, Professor Miles' statement that modernity you know, has really been successful because it wrote on the back of imperialism. Uh, regardless of what was the origin, the fact of the matter is that through diffusion, we have all accepted this parts of, I mean, the fact that the language of enlightenment was used by colonized states in order to gain independence, uh, to make new modern nation states and so on, you know. So the process of diffusion has occurred. Uh, and uh, we have acculturized it, you know. We, West Eastern societies are not simply consumers of all of these ideas, but there's been process of adoption and adaptation and so on. Uh, you're right. Uh, that uh, Mr. Heidel, that there's been a souring because of the unilateralism. But my question is coming back to the Western foreign policies. Through process of acculturations, the modernizations of the rest of the world, the West seems to be feeling hemmed in. That the challenge of enlightenment is not in the rest, but actually in the West. How do you explain, you know, how, how can we go forward after all of the rise of populism and intolerance uh, Trumpism or Trumpism uh, with America first and, and, and on all of this xenophobic uh, development in the, uh, in the West. How do we go about it? You know, backlash in the rest of the world, but also this increasingly inward looking countries that used to be the champion of liberal world order. Yes, thank you. Ivai? Thank you. Um, I don't like the concept of the West of the rest. If you think about the universal, uh, I don't think it's a rest. Oh, uh, uh, it's a common no question. Uh, ten years ago, when I worked in Brussels, uh, there's a debate between the Russian ambassador with the MEP. Uh, the, the Europeans look down upon to Russia because they are not uh, enough of the enlightenment of the Renaissance, even, with, uh, even without of that. But the Russians strongly uh, response. Uh, the enlightenment because of uh, the Middle, a Middle Age period which does not exist in Russia or any other places. So that means the Europeans, you, ha, you, you ha, had a disease, and then you recover it, you have the medicine. And then you enforce others to, uh, to eat your medicine. Uh, it's like that kind of a debate. And then I think we can make a midway, the Chinese way is, yes, maybe it's a pandemic, it's a favor, we should, everybody should uh, have that kind of uh, medicine. But it's not enforced, we should have uh, our traditional medicine, not the Western medicine. So I think uh, uh, it's like a universal declaration on human rights. Actually, the, one of the Chinese president of the Tianjin University was asked to draft uh, this uh, contest by the Madame Rosefer. The first sentence originally said is that every man and woman are created equal. And he changed this, said, no, not created, because you believe in God. We don't believe in that your God. So every man and woman are born equal. So that's the sentence now. So I think that can, we should contribute. So that I, I think uh, we should eat medicine, but not enforced. We can eat medicines in our way. So that's the universalism and the localization. <laughs> Thank you. Very quickly, um, Veronica and then James. Very quickly, I agree with the, that the idea that tolerance is the key to all this. Um, the trouble is, it's very easy to use a catch word like that. The difficulty is in, when you're dealing with an international order, is encapsulating it. I mean, you, you're, the example you've just given is, is, a, is a very good one, in fact. If you don't believe in God, yes, of course, you aren't created, you're born. And I think the West, if you like, has had it, uh, has been dominant for a long time. Now it is, uh, I think the need for tolerance is manifestly there. So I entirely agree with that uh, suggestion. Yeah, I would just say that on tolerance, uh, tolerance took a, wasn't sort of born out of the Enlightenment straight off. Uh, 
You have to remember that in my country, Catholics were not emancipated until 1830. And not, the Enlightenment was uh, well underway when the penal laws um, were applicable in Ireland and led to the phrase to hell or connaught which, roughly speaking, summed up the rights of Protestants in relation to Catholics. So tolerance internally was not part of the Enlightenment. The Enlightenment made it possible for tolerance to develop. And it was, in a sense, uh, it, it, uh, so that if to say, w w was, were we in the northeast of... Uh, India, for example, the Raj, was it particularly tolerant or anywhere else? The answer is obviously no. This took a, a, a very long time to uh, build up, but its seed was perhaps there. Um, I do think that there is a, a sort of, I think Europeans are very, and I include Britain in, in that thing, a, a very uh, slow to slough off. I mean, they know that they have lost their sort of domination in the world, but they, the attitudes that somehow the Enlightenment belongs to them and it is their unique gift to humanity, I think, is, is very deeply embedded in the European psyche and is therefore quite difficult to get rid of. Of course they know that it has been internalized everywhere, that there other people have for a long time been, in a sense, not only joining them, but beating them at their own game. But there is a feeling, and of course, the fact that the European Union was an economic arrangement with a political soul, in other words, it was designed to solve the Franco-German problem. Um, a problem of nationalism. That was immensely important, and the, the Europeans to this day find it very difficult not to go around the world. They're less bad at it than they used to be, but to go around the world telling people the way to solve their problems is to adopt the uh, formula which was adopted uh, with the European states. <laughs> coal and steel community leading to the European economic community. So yes, I think we're, there, they are in a sense, um, not so much in denial, but having to face very important adjustments at the moment. Well, thank you very much for your attention and thank you for your questions. It's not uh, difficult, of course, to find uh, contradictions in the whole question of the enlight enlightenment and the consequences thereof. After all, several liberal Western democracies didn't give uh, women uh, electoral rights till the 1970s. Mm. So, um, so the contradictions are there are plenty. But let me thank very much uh, Salman Heather, Veronica Sutherland, and James Mail for their contributions to this discussion. And um, uh, we shall move on now a little bit late to the next session. Sitting down. Let me...
May I request all of you to please be settled down? We would now go on to the next session, session two, on uh, values in East Asian foreign policy. Uh, we have uh, the chair for the session, Jyoti Malhotra, on the dais, and the speakers, Wang Ey, Aftab Seth, and Tadashi Anno. Over to you, Jyoti Malhotra. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can you hear me? No? <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the second session of our conference, Values in Foreign Policy, Interests and Ideals. And first of all, I'd like to thank Mr. Krishnan Srinivasan for inviting me here. And um, I was actually a little circumspect about coming because all of you have the luxury, you've all been practitioners of foreign policy, of diplomacy. Some of you, Ravi Velur, a, a fellow journalist <laughs> in this uh, room. And people like me and, uh, and Ravi, I think we have our nose to the ground, so sometimes we don't have that luxury of, of looking at values from afar. But the, the discussion this morning was fascinating, and especially my panelist, Wong Yi Wei. I hope I have the pronunciation right. Uh, comments about how there can be a Chinese way and that we perhaps should adopt the middle path. Um, I, you know, we'll, we'll take that up, uh, Mr. Wong, but let me first introduce my panel to you. I have with me on my left Ambassador Aftab Seth, um, one of India's best known ambassadors. He was ambassador to Japan, of course. Uh, but also to Greece, Vietnam, and is currently chairman of the Japan-India Partnership Forum. Uh, Tadashi Ano, on my extreme left, who's with the Sofia Institute of International Relations in Japan, and Wong Yiwei, um, the Jean Monnet Chair Professor at the Rinman University in Beijing. So without much ado, I think I'm going to um, we, we should begin our panel discussion about values and interests. There's never a better time than right now to discuss this topic, even as, uh, and I'm afraid I'm going to be a journalist for a few seconds. An Indian Air Force pilot who, has, um, who was captured in Pakistan and is going to be returned today by Pakistan this afternoon, we hear. Uh, there have been airstrikes by the Indian Air Force in Pakistan and retaliatory strikes by the Pakistan Air Force. And China, represented by Mr. Wong on my right, which has supported Pakistan in not proscribing Masood Azhar, a terrorist. So we can argue whether this is a Chinese value or whether it's a Chinese national interest because the Chinese argue that there isn't enough evidence. And we know that the China-Pakistan relationship is, is very, very close. It's as intimate as you know, teeth to jaw, all-weather relationship. Um, and then we have the Japanese um, on, on my left, who also have a, a very close relationships with China, with the couriers, and are able to balance this perhaps in some ways. Um, I think India, and Ambassador Seth, I'd like you to come in there. What do we do? What does India do in living in a difficult neighborhood? Do we, um, do we follow Buddha's middle path, which is not the Chinese way, not the Western way, but our own way? Um, is, there an, is there an Indian way? I think that's, that's a question that I'd like Ambassador Aftab Seth to answer. 
So perhaps opening comments uh, from all of you, and then we'll take a discussion forward. Ambassador Seth, can I ask you to lead this, please? Oh, yes, please. Okay. Um, I'm going to um, just talk briefly about East Asian values and foreign policy, if you like, uh, from a general point of view, and then focus a little more on values in Japan's foreign policy, which is something that um, I have been uh, dealing with for a bit. Um, if you look at East Asia, Korea, China, Japan, Mongolia, um, if there is a common thread uh, a common value system which affected all these countries, especially uh, China, Japan, and Korea, it is the value of Confucianism, with its emphasis on filial piety, benevolence, a respect for the literati, the, the mandarins in China, the educated samurai in Japan. And, um, of course, in Japan, this would have come in on a basic foundation of the native Shinto system of values, which extols the position of the emperor, which um, requires you to uh, protect nature, non-human nature, uh, which requires uh, ritual and purity. Um, next month, uh, there will be a new chief Shinto priest, currently the crown prince, and I'm sure his father, who will abdicate next month, is busy giving him last minute instructions on arcane Shinto rituals which only the emperor knows and passes down from generation to generation. Um, on this, both with China, with Korea, and with Japan, came the imported value system of Buddhism, which Jyoti just mentioned. The values of egalitarianism, um, protection of non-human nature, and uh, all animal life. Um, Nonviolence. Uh, this had an impact on all these uh, three countries uh, in in different ways, and then of course you have the uh, the Enlightenment and Western values, uh, Christian values, if you like, uh, Western liberal democratic ideas, and. Christian ideas. We had Francis Xavier 450 years ago coming to Macau in China and to Kagoshima and Miyazaki in the southern island of Kyushu. And so you had this Western Christian influence coming in to these countries. Of course, Korea had a much larger uh, wash of Christian influences and, and therefore you have cults uh, Christian cults in Korea, which you do not have to the same degree in China or Japan. Um, the Western presence, of course, I'll, I'll come to that with Japan uh, in a little more detail, but in China, uh, the Sung sisters were a famous example of um, uh, Western influences being brought into China. Of course, one married Sun Yat-sen and the other man at Chiang Kai-shek, and both these <laughs> men had um, a great impact on Chinese history and Chinese foreign policy, each in its own way, and of course, one triumphed finally in 1949, and we know the story after that. So, um, in Japan, communism uh, came in as well, but largely remained on the margins uh, except perhaps briefly in the interwar years. And um, uh, it was a force uh, 
uh, in maybe the 50s, 60s, and early 70s. I remember when President Eisenhower's visit uh, in 1960 for the US-Japan Treaty was torpedoed largely because of the influence of the Zengakuren, which was the student body, but strong communist influences. But then the communists slowly faded out. And from uh, maybe 10% of the diet, now I think they're down to maybe one or 2%. And the left generally in Japanese politics has gone. Um, now, um, we have um, um, uh, this history of uh, between Japan and China, and we know, of course, that in the 30s uh, there was a considerable conflict between China and Japan, um, which has its impact even today. And we know that after the, Russo the Sino-Japanese War of 1895. Japan uh, annexed Korea and ruled Korea till 1945. And there was a great deal of Japanization in Korea, including questions of the language. Um, and there were other uh, factors like uh, forced use of labor, both male and female. And this has its impact right down mm -hmm. till today, in spite of uh, agreements having been reached both in China when uh, Kakue Tanaka uh, reconnected Japan with uh, communist China following the Nixon Mao meeting. Um, so uh, the communists in, in, um, uh, in Japan uh, are no longer much of an influence. Let me now briefly look at the uh, values in Japan's foreign policy in somewhat greater detail. Um, ha having resisted the two attempts by the Mongols to invade um, Japan, the, there was a, a very strong belief that Japan was a divine country. And the kamikaze, that is the divine wind, which sent the Mongol fleet down into the bottom of the sea was seen as evidence of this kind of divine uh, protect, uh, protection. And the, this belief in divinity has transferred itself to the person of the emperor, who is considered a divine personage, tracing his uh, descent from the sun goddess Amataras Omikami. Uh, that is the belief that the present emperor and his son who will succeed are direct descendants of the sun goddess Amataras Omikami. This, this is the basis of Shinto, the idea of purity in ritual and extolling of the uh, position of the emperor. And Japan has been a great imbiber and a learner uh, taking from uh, China and through Korea uh, the language, the, the script, tea, pottery, and many other things. Um, okay. So, um, if we look at Japan's foreign policy uh, before the war and after the war, Obviously, there is the strong Shinto Confucian basis, but the Western beliefs also became very strong, including through Fukuzawa Yukichi, uh, the, the founder of modern Japan, who was a samurai from Kyushu. And these Western beliefs uh, translated themselves into a democratic framework, a, dem um, a democratic constitution, uh, the Meiji Constitution, which had its infirmities, of course, but the Constitution scripted by the Americans post-1945 uh, is largely based on what you could call Western values. Uh, 
But Japan's foreign policy has clearly got traces of its strong Shinto Confucian beliefs, and this is in evidence in many of the things that the Japanese do till today. I shall leave it at that, Jyoti, uh, for the moment. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador Sid. May I now ask um, Mr. Wong Yi Wee to, to make his uh, remarks. And, and my question to you also, Mr. Wong, apart from your own remarks, is if you could also ponder over perhaps, uh, you know, you talked a little bit about the Chinese way, but is there one Chinese way or do you also have, you know, like in India, we have so many Indian ways. We have a Kerala way and a Punjab way. I mean, I'm from Punjab. My husband is from Kerala, so he's a, he, there's a Kerala way and there's a Bengal way. So in China, for example, you have this great ancient civilization. Do you have a Tibetan way? Do you have a Xinjiang way, a Uyghur way? Do you have, you know, I mean, or just are the Han Chinese, are you going to be the emperors of Asia? So perhaps you could also reflect on that. Thank you so much. Very good question. Before China joined the uh, United Nations, uh, resumed the position in the United Nations City Council in the 1960s, the Chairman Mao said, there is no need for China to join the United Nations because we are a small United Nations. <laughs> That's what they said. 56 ethnic groups, so diverse. So there are, in political meaning, one China principle, but uh, there are three Chinas, traditional China, modern China, global China. Traditional China, we learn Buddhism from uh, India. Modern China, we learn many from Japan about uh, Western values, communism, socialism, all this through Japan, maybe, most of them. Global China, global citizen, like we have more than 800 million netizens. This is, uh, uh, so like my clothes, I dress like India, right? People say that, but it's a very more Western style with that. Actually, this is a Chinese uh, youth uh, uh, uniform or something. But already originally from uh, Prussia, it's a German. Maybe you don't know. <laughs> the, peop uh, the People's Republic of China, people, republic, all the Western concept. Communism, socialism, our belief from the West. What day is today? It's not a Buddha's birthday or Chairman Mao's birthday. It's Jesus Christ's birthday, 2019, right? <laughs> the February, oh, it's now March of the first. So everything actually from the West. But the Chinese is making the localized. It's like a Buddhism. We learn from ancient India, but be the Zen or the Chinese culture. Even popular in China, but not so popular in India as more. Karl Marxism also channelized, socialism, everything. So when Google want to enter uh, in, in Chinese market, the Chinese government said, you should register as a Chinese company. And then Google denied, and then no Google. And then that's Chinese Google, Baidu. Okay, so everything should be localized. I think that's a China experience. We are not against that. It's like the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. Uh, we translate as the World Declaration on Human Rights. Because we don't have to think that's the universe. But there is a common values of the human being. So that's, I think, basically what I would share with you. The Committee of Shared Future for Humankind, the recent put forth by President Xi Jinping. What does it mean? And uh, why we, what, what did we learn from the past and from the West and uh, from Japan? This is the railway, 1960s and 1970s, uh, more than 70 years. China helped the, uh, Tanzania and Zambia build the 100, uh, 1,800 kilometers of, high speed, uh, of the rail. Uh, China sent more than uh, 30, 50,000, uh, 5,000, 500, oh, no, sorry, 30,000 more than uh, workers there, and then uh, hundreds of them died for this. Uh. During that time, China was a very, uh, in a very difficult time. But Chairman Mao said to Nelio, said, you have your difficulties, but your difficulties is different with my difficulties. Even we do not want to build our uh, railway, but to build for you. Because uh, Zambia is a landlocked country, they need the port. Uh, so that, that reason, we spend more than 200 million uh, Chinese uh, yuan to build this uh, rail for, for that. That's the reason. And then the new uh, Mombasa Nairobi uh, railway, the president of Kenya wrote in uh, Chinese, the English, and uh, Swazili, uh, saying that this is uh, changed the, uh, totally the destiny of the Kenya. It's a dream about uh, that, because it's uh, one hour, two, 
120 kilometers. It's two times faster than the previous uh, British standard, uh, the, the, the meter uh, rail. Totally changed, not just the future of Kenya, but even all other six Eastern African countries because it helps to access to the ocean. Also, that's uh, what he said. Okay, you asked me, uh, China support uh, Pakistan. We are not support Pakistan everything. We support Pakistan to lift the poverty, to deal with the terrorism. But the lift the poverty and the terrorism, you should build more roads, infrastructure. Like the Chinese people say, if we get rich, build the road. If we want to get rich quickly, build the motor road. So that's the reason China-Pakistan economic corridors help them to deal with fundamentally solve this problem, not just temporarily, I think. So we we, we uh, against all the terrorism in all kinds of them. That's uh, definitely on the size of the uh, India and Pakistan uh, government uh, per se. So that's the reason many projects, uh, Bell Road and, uh, and the Chinese people in the local currency, like uh, in Sri Lanka, in Malawi, and uh, Mauritius, and uh, that. So the, uh, the community of shared future are different with the tradition of Mao's of the, uh, revolution uh, or the uh, anti-imperialism, anti-colonism, anti-hegemonism, uh, even that uh, focus more on the relations with the developing countries. And then Deng Xiaoping focus more on the relations with the developing country, win-win. Uh, uh, now the President Xi are more focus on the whole world and not just the developing or developed with the BRI. So that, that's the, uh, basically the ideas to raise the, uh, to answer the question, who are we, where are we in from, and where uh, we are going. Actually, after the Brexit, people raised the questions. There is the global Britain, the Great Britain, or European Britain. So who are you? <laughs> Turkey, and China also, uh, and many other countries as well. So the great, uh, the great uh, 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 historian of the time being who answered the, maybe the Eastern civilization, the Confucianism, or the, maybe give us an answer because it's more focused on harmonious, it's not divide. So the Chinese traditional culture, we say, is a more uh, he and he, peace and cooperation. So now peace and uh, harmonious is more community of shared future. And collaboration, cooperation is more mutually connected. That's a Belt and Road Initiative. That are twin brothers of that. So because the world is divided too much, we need more united. We need more duties, not too much freedoms. You say the, uh, the in, in individualism, too much individualism is not good for the whole nation. So the Chinese thing about the differences is not just a tolerance. Someday when you cannot tolerate anymore, and then anti-Muslim, you know, anti-sentiments. Uh, we say appreciation. The differences is to make the opportunities for you to learn from others. Like Confucian says, if three people work there, one should be my teacher. Which different with the U Americans? Americans says, three people work there, I should be their teacher. So that, that's, okay. So the Taoism, the harmonious between yin and yang, and the Buddhism talk about the Krishna, Krishna, the, the, have the shared destiny, we learn from ancient history. So be the Zen. Uh, so this is no, no somebody conquered, designed to conquer the world, so much social, uh, scientific. And, so that's the uh, three gods in China, Buddhism, Taoism, and Confucian. They work together, they learn from each other. They're not just tolerate from each other. They appreciate to learn from each other. I think that's the difference with the West. And then we, why we think there's no universal? Because the universal is, a, is one god. There are three gods. So we're there, all under heaven. So that's the reason we translate the universal declaration on human rights as the, uh, the world. This is the Shaolin Temple. There's a logo. We, we, people look it's look at Confucius or Taoists or even Buddha, the same, whatever you, <laughs> you like. So the one symbol, one bottle can, can be uh, in a different gods. Uh, I think that's the, uh, and how to achieve this is a traditional China. The modern China, as I said, is uh, we learn from within the failure system, we join the Grabtio, all this, except the, and the most important the Chinese government and uh, Indians and others to uh, put forward the uh, peaceful, a coexistence, five principles of that. On the basis of that, uh, the president she put forward the Committee of the Shared Future, which are five pillars of uh, core values, uh, lasting peace, uh, common prosperity, uh, prosperity, and common security, not your security on the basis of the others, and security, and open and inclusive, but domestically, internationally, and then finally, a clean and beautiful world, environment, sustainable development. So today's world, so many troubles because too much focus on the, the individualism or nationalist interests. Not so much focus on the long term and the whole interests of the human hand. I think that's, 
Everything uh, when the U.S. Uh, president used the international community, actually it's not so international. It's the maybe the U.K.-U.S. alliance or uh, the Western blocs. So we, sh we should focus on, on the human beings per se, because many countries, even their tribal system, the central government is not controlled, not governed so well like in Pakistan. So we need to make all the NGOs, all the people, not just the uh, government level, to collaborate, to deal with the, uh, the common challenges that all the human beings are facing. Leave the poverty, build more mutual connectivities. I think that's the inclusiveness. I think the traditional way, the European way, is a high standard, to match the high standard. The US way is a more uh, exclusive, hub spoken system. So we should build the bridge, let it more inclusive, and then to adapt your high standard to local uh, conditions. Thus, we learn also from uh, Klan. They also have a similar thing about the common destiny. And also uh, from ancient India, my ambassador. Uh, told me about they also have the one family concept. The Taiko said the, the, people, uh, the world is like the net. I think that's uh, mutualism and Kraman and also Tao and also have similar ideas of that. I think that's the reason we need more united in yeah, different common values but not too much separate with too much interest in the individualism or with on the tolerance basis. So that reason, uh, I think the, uh, the Communist Party of China also rebuilt because it's a traditional co uh, communism is want to overthrow the capitalism system. But when we say the common destiny means every country, every citizen, you should have your own destiny, but not do, do, uh, interfere with domestic affairs of others. So this, I think, makes the Karmaxism localized with the Chinese culture, which is uh, more inclusive and be harmonious, not too much revolution from the previous Karmax said. So that's the reason, uh, I think, uh, North Korea and uh, some other uh, socialist countries, they, they dislike China, because China makes this more culturalized. I think that's very important, not to make it too much uh, revolutionary style. And then the Belt Road Initiative is to try to build, make the, all the countries to hold their own destiny. For instance, in Africa, like the Franco countries, the two countries, the two neighbors, they don't have a direct flight. They should change their flight from Paris and then reach your neighbor. So how those countries can have the own destiny? The, they, they even cannot build any uh, 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 industrial uh, products. So that reason, I think, uh, help them to internationalize and build more mutually connected. And then that's the Belt Initiative. And lift the poverty to share the experience with, 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 with China. Like Albert Einstein says, also Europe, uh, the future is more mutually connected through the Euro-Asia continent with China. <laughs> also, that, that's the joke. Okay, the global value chain, when the China uh, cut up with, uh, 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 with the West and the more competition, that's where the trade war happens. At the same time, the other Belt and Road countries, they are just live in uh, decades, some two decades or, uh, ago of China's experience. So China's experience of the open reform, industrialization, urbanization is very fresh to share with those countries that lift their, their, uh, that lift their level in the global value chain. And uh, of course, to um, cooperate with US and the uh, uh, of European Union. Because the US focus on innovation more save the labor efficiency, and the European Union is more save the energy and the resources, sustainable development. But the developing countries, they are poor. They're just rich labor, rich resources. If you both save them, they're more marginalized. In today's world, half of the world population even cannot access the internet. 1.1 billion people without access to the electricity. So when you, every people talk about AI, 5G, those people are more and more marginalized. So that, that's the Belt Road they want to make the bridge because China is very efficient to marginalize, marginalization of the technology of the internet. Uh, like 5G, Huawei, or all, all this, and, it, and India as well, I think. So many things we can share with, uh, with India about building the roads, building the mutual connectivity to, to, to deal with the poverty and violence. So and, and again, Muslims, they're more focused on the man and the God, and the Christianity, man and the nature, and Chinese and the India, maybe, man and the man. So both, we should focus on the relations, treat them as equal, as we, and then make the globalization is more inclusive, balanced, this is not a true globalization. It's a partial globalization. People still, many people live in darkness. Those. Now, many projects like in Africa and Latin America, when China built a road, built a and then they turn light, lightness. So to solve this problem of that. Internet as well, that make them more inclusive. So that McKenzie predict, because the more and more get more people, horizontally uh, opportunities, not vertically, 
I think that's the change the globalization more and more efficient. That's the reason can compute more internet, okay? And then uh, one example is energy. 1.1 people without electricity, but with those poor countries, areas, they have the oil or, ga or, or gas, and then if you use this, more CO2 emission. So we should cut the CO2 emission and then give the electricity for them. And then in the mid, mid uh, Central Asians, we have the turn the oil and the gas into electricity, use UHV in Xinjiang, and then send to the South Asia in Pakistan, for instance. And then help them to build the, uh, uh, the electricity. And in Nepal, also without enough electricity. But Nepal have many water resources, but without industrialization uh, base. So that reason, I think, uh, put all this together to solve the problem uh, and then cut CO2 emission. Okay, that's the global uh, energy network, the, the office located in Beijing, uh, approved by President Xi in the United Nations in 2015. And then that, I think that's uh, the, uh, the, the Chinese contribution of that. The recent natural science magazine indicate the world in recent decades, the cut of CO2 emission because of the Chinese contribution. If if other countries follow the old trap of the polluted first and then kill the pollution, and then the costs are too high. So I think the China uh, experience, particularly for the open reform, I think we learn from the West, from Japan, from, and then we can make then other uh, developing countries localized. And then that's the Bureau Initiative and the community of destiny. And then go beyond the too much modernity. It's a burden, tolerance. One day you cannot tolerate it anymore. And then America first, and then big trouble. So our culture is like that, to serve the people, work for the all for all, by all, and for all. Thank you. If we have uh, more, we have a Hindu edition of the Belgian Initiative. Oh. Thank you. That was fascinating, Mr. Wong. Thank you so much for your very, very interesting remarks. Um, may I turn to Mr. Tadashiano? So Mr. Ano, um, OK, once you get your. Yeah. Do you want to just exchange this? Yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mr. Anno, apart from your presentation, I was wondering if you could also perhaps ponder a little bit and reflect on what Mr. Wong just said. You know, he talked about how. Uh, and I was struck by his remarks on Google, for example, mm -hmm. when Google did not want to um, become Chinese, it was not allowed into the country. So do you think that Japan can perhaps become a bridge, not only in Asia, but even between Europe, the US, and uh, you know, parts of the world like us? 